Well, thank you very much. It's great to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm going to have a drink of water. So I'm going to talk about the potential for finding a signal of climate change in the Anthropocene. And that is subtly, well, no, not subtly, quite different than talking about climate change writ large. So I would, I would beg your mercy that if I do not touch on a particular aspect of climate change as we typically hear it, it is because I am focusing the question on do we see a signal of climate change in the Anthropocene? And I'm going to touch on those three issues that you can see on the, on the screen. So I'll, I'll, I'll go through a quick reminder of uh, the state of climate change as it is essentially today, which I think most of you will be very aware of. I'll talk about some of the direct impacts of climate change as it speaks to the Anthropocene, and then some indirect impacts. And moving down that list from the top to the bottom, I know less and less, um, but also moving down that list, I think it becomes more and more interesting, um, which you can decide perhaps. So a quick reminder about state of climate change. These are diagrams from the latest um, uh, assessment report number five from the IPCC. And in this case, you can see uh, variations of the principal greenhouse gases, CO2, methane, and uh, N2O. There's no surprise here. We know that they are continuing to accumulate. Even now, the diagram is slightly out of date because the modern um, content of CO2 in the atmosphere is about 400 parts per million by volume. I put two time markers on that diagram, and they will appear in similar diagrams. They are they are not, um, sorry, I don't know if you can see them actually. I can see them, um, but one marks 1750 and one marks 1950. They're not suggestions as to that's where the Anthropocene should or did begin. They're just time markers to put you, to give you some framework. So greenhouse gases continue to accumulate, this we know. Sea level also continues to rise. The diagram here, the, the upper left-hand diagram, is the last 3,000 years of sea level, so during the, the later part of the Holocene. And as you can see, it's relatively stable. Um, it's, an, it's, it's mapped here as an anomaly. I know you cannot see the numbers, but the important part is that it's essentially a straight line. And the data types are very different, which means there's a lot of scatter. And the, the lower diagram shows the sea level uh, rise from tide gauges, again, from a number of different studies. And in each case, there is, there is a consensus. They're all using different methods, by the way, uh, to, to same data, but different methods to derive those um, results. And the take-home line for the Anthropocene is that the, the maximum, or at least the, the average uh, absolute sea level rise during the last uh, 120 years is 20 centimeters. Uh, in places, of course, it's, it's much larger than that, and in places, it's much smaller than that. I have intentionally not shown the projections into the future, because I, again, I want to emphasize that this is about climate change signals in the Anthropocene as we recognize it today. So this map shows the spatial variation in sea level rise, and the small diagrams around the edge uh, are particular places. So uh, you've got San Francisco, um, Charlottetown, Stockholm, Antofagasta, Manila, and Pago Pago, but it could be as well be six other places. And the, the, the thin lines on the small diagrams are the global mean sea level, and then the, the, the noisier lines are more difficult to see are the local sea level variations uh, since about 19, get this right, um, about 1950. 
And of course, the map shows, shows the spatial variation. But the point of the diagram, even if you can't actually see the details, is that there is a significant spatial variation. There is no single global uniform signal of sea level. And there won't be for a long time, if ever. Um, precipitation. This shows uh, from various studies, again, various types of data, the sort of the precipitation anomaly uh, with respect to an average time duration within that time frame. And that diagram shows values from 1900 to 2010. And the take home message from that diagram is simply that there is so much um, natural variability in precipitation in a global sense that it is very difficult to pull out a definitive uh, a statement about whether things are getting wetter or drier as an average. There are certainly regional changes that are very significant that we kind of uh, we know about in an anecdotal sense in any case. But in the global sense, um, the change in precipitation is not um, significant in terms of, of the Anthropocene. This is uh, a map of the surface ocean uh, temperature change per decade. So the scale on the right hand side is degrees Celsius per decade and it goes up to about 0.3 and down to minus 0.3. Again, the point is to show that it's, it's extremely variable in a spatial sense. This is only for the top part of the ocean, of course, at the top 700 meters. Um, and so there's, again, there's, the global signal is, is relatively small. The local signal can be very large, as we'll see in a few slides from now. Um, coastal waters, in particular, have heated up. Uh, there is less heating, as you might expect, in, in uh, open ocean waters. And the, the one that most people sort of zero in on and fight about um, is, is the surface air, temp surface air temperature, which here are some several data sets going from 1850 to 2010. And you can see for yourself uh, that um, things are, are progressively increasing. And the total change since about uh, 1850, if you draw a crude line, is on an order of magnitude of about one degree. So since pre-industrial times, the global average temperature has changed by about plus one degree. Locally, of course, it can be very different, particularly in the northern polar regions. But as on a global average, that's the state of the art, or the state of the system right now. So our climate is kind of lagging behind the forcing of the climate, which is also to be expected because there's a great deal of inertia in the climate system. So let's go to that second issue that I had on the front, the, my, my first slide, um, the direct impacts of climate change that speak to the Anthropocene. So trying to find climate change in the Anthropocene directly. Coastal erosion is perhaps the most obvious um, signal we might look for. But of course, coastal erosion is happening all the time. Um, and it's, it's quite hard to pick out um, an Anthropocene signal it might be easier when we begin to erode uh, man-made things like, like roads. Uh, and so you, you find those particular deposits uh, um, embroiled in the natural deposits as well. But it's worthwhile um, reminding you that the coast is a very dynamic system in any case. So here's a picture or a series of Google images from part of the English coast, or the east coast, facing, facing the Netherlands. And if you notice the scale, I don't know if you can see the scale from, from there, but there's a little white bar in the bottom of that diagram, it's half a kilometer long. And there's a small town in the middle of that uh, picture as well, that, that should set the scale for you. And this goes from 19, so these images will go from 1945 up to about now. And so what you're gonna, you're gonna watch this coast change position. This is the first 
increment from 45 to 99, and it's moved about two kilometers. It's moving at a rate of about 20 to 30 meters a year, which is phenomenal, actually. This is the 2005 state of the coast, and it continues to move rapidly. So the coast is a very dynamic feature anyway, and, and, and the process by which geology is made has a lot of inertia to it, unlike the atmosphere itself, which is a very sort of short memory, if you like. Um, our geological processes have a long memory, and so they're responding to things that have happened in the past, as well as things that are happening today. So it makes it very difficult to deconvolve climate change, modern climate change, from things that have happened in the past, and for that matter, from, from human processes and human activity today. Some other coastal things that are happening as a result, direct result of climate change, um, bleaching of corals. These are images taken from some of the uh, Caribbean corals in 2005, I think that's correct, in which there was a massive bleaching event. About 80% of uh, Caribbean corals were bleached and about 40% of those died. So that is, um, but, the, but there is recovery too. So it's, it's a signal it might be a permanent signal, but it's not a significant permanent signal at the moment. Um, that effect is happening both as a consequence of temperature, but principally as a consequence of changing pH uh, and acidification. Now, I did not mention acidification in, in sort of uh, giving you this quick reminder of how climate change is, is at the moment. Uh, that's because there is so much natural variability and spatial variability in, in, in the pH. Uh, that it's, there is no trend to it at the moment, globally. Uh, this is another example of a shallow coastal system that uh, is affected, in this case, by warming waters. Coastal waters have warmed by up to four or five degrees in some places. So a combination of, of both pH and warming waters are destroying mussel beds, for example. In Northern California, the, the loss of something like 60% of species of mussel beds that may or may not be preserved in the geological record, but it's not a significant signal right now. Um, likewise, there are multiple forcings on the state of deltas and the delivery of sediment to the ocean. Um, most of the big deltas in the world are sinking, so they are in fact places where there's likely, likely to be uh, Anthropocene sediments or an Anthropocene signal preserved, but Again, deconvolving climate out of that is very difficult. And I won't belabor this point because um, uh, Professor Savitsky will talk about, I think, this sort of thing after me, so I'll leave it up to him. But here's an example of the difficulty of deconvolving climate from human um, activities. This is a, a plume coming out of a, an estuary um, in, in um, Washington State, USA. This is a result of a dam removal, nothing to do with climate change. Um, but it could be if you saw that in the record. It could be interpreted that way. So um, a conclusion from this, that second sort of part is that modern climate change is still too small to have left a definitive signal in the Anthropocene, and it's too difficult, perhaps not productive, to try to deconvolve these things. But there is a signal of climate change in the Anthropocene, in fact, and it gets quite big. Uh, and it has to do with this other, another aspect of the, um, the CO2 being released in the atmosphere, and that is the particular isotope signature. This is not a very good diagram, I apologize for that, um, but, but what you should take away from, well, I'll, I'll tell you what you're looking at, since you can't really see it. This is a 1312 carbon isotope ratio, and it, it goes from the year 1000 to 2000, to the last 1000 years, basically. And you can see it's steady, so the year 2000 is, is near me. You can see the 1750 time mark. It's stable up to about um, 1750, and it begins to drop. It begins to reduce. On the vertical scale, the numbers aren't so important for now, but they, in any case, they go from minus 6 at the top to minus 8 at the bottom. That is a negative excursion, we call it, in this case, and it's, it's per mil, by the way. It is a negative excursion of minus two 
minus two per mil, which is geologically huge. If we look at that, the, 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 the part near me uh, in more detail, then it looks like this. And again, it's, it, it does not show very well to you. You can come and look at my slides here or later if you want to. Um, we look at there's a second inflection point on that figure, and that inflection point occurs at 1950. The numbers are not, are not different. This, is a, this time goes from 1800 to 2000. So the point is that there is a source of carbon in the release of CO2 that is fundamentally different than the source of carbon pre-industrial times. And of course, that source of carbon is well known to you. It's principally um, geological, deep time coal that has been mined. This is a coal mine in North England. This is the source of climate, modern climate change, and this is leaving a significant signal in the Anthropocene, both as a negative hole that you've heard Jan refer to, and as subsequent deposits elsewhere. This is a coal deposit, an Anthropocene coal deposit, on the beach, uh, just a few miles away from, from that particular coal mine. And in fact, those coal deposits on the beach are so good that they're still mined. Still mined, this is a figure from 2001. And they still use horses and carts because it's too wet to put a vehicle down there. Um, here's another example of the impact of climate change, the source of climate change in the Anthropocene. This is a picture of uh, the areas of coal mining in South Wales. I wonder if you can see anything on that slide. Um, and the next figure shows the, the, the residual uh, materials, the slurry from that coal mining preserved in the sediments of the River Severn um, as a result of that coal mining. So that is uh, an Anthropocene deposit. It's, it's a modern deposit that, that speaks directly to climate change, the source of climate change. And these figures show the the concentration of coal particles with depth in a, in, a, in a core taken from sediments from the River Severn estuary. And the peak of those coal particles is about 20, 30 centimetres, which means you're already burying uh, that Anthropocene unit, if you like. It is becoming part of the geological record. Likewise, there are signals in almost any delta where there is oil extraction, which is most deltas in the world. Uh, this happens to be one in Nigeria, which um, is particularly poorly managed. Um, there are, a, as a result of uh, the extraction of oil by itself and the various accidents that happen downstream, there are uh, pollutants and organic, very complex organic compounds uh, organic pollutants or polyaromatic um, carbon isotopes, sorry, polyaromatic hydrocarbons in, uh, buried now in the deltaic uh, sediments that are being buried as that delta is subsiding. It's a, an Anthropocene unit that is going to be preserved. Um, and the last and perhaps I think the, the potentially the biggest signal of climate change, modern climate change, in the environment um, and in the Anthropocene comes from the, the need to mitigate prospective, uh, or the prospect of climate change or pending climate change. So I've made the point that climate change itself is still relatively small at the moment, but we know that there's more coming. And of course, sensible and responsible planners and policy makers are not stupid. They know that to protect a country, such as Holland in this case, you need to develop flood mitigation infrastructure. Well, that is developing an Anthropocene unit, as, as various folks have, have talked about. Um, that the, the figure in the bottom right is a report from the UK Environmental Agency about um, what's going to happen in the Thames Estuary in 2100. And what it, what's going to happen, what, what the plan is, to build ultimately a bigger Thames barrier. 
because it's a response to climate change, and that response to climate change is a massive infrastructure that will be part of the Anthropocene record. Um, here's a slightly more invidious um, uh, uh, role that legislation and policy has uh, uh, connecting climate change and, and the Anthropocene. This is the front cover or the, the frontispiece of an article from the Journal of Environmental Science and Technology. And the title of this is Economic Incentives and Regulatory Framework for Shale Gas Well Site Reclamation in Pennsylvania. And what this article talks about is the economics of um, legislation that is imposed in this case by Pennsylvania on folks who want to, on folks, on companies who want to uh, uh, drill for um, uh, uh, in fracking operations uh, for, for shale gas. And I've highlighted part of the abstract, and I'm going to read this to you, if I may, following the lead by uh, Naomi yesterday. The economics of shale gas development favor transfer of assets from large entities to smaller ones. With the assets go the liabilities and without a mechanism to prevent the new owners from assuming reclamation liabilities beyond their means, the economics favor default on well plugging and site restoration obligations. What that means is um, that it's cheaper, it's, it's, it's cheaper for the, for the companies to abandon the site than to have to pay the bond or to pay, so not pay the bond, but to um, to pay the costs of land reclamation after a certain time. Um, so the bond covers a certain amount of time. They leave before that bond um, is up and they don't have to pay the reclamation costs because they pass the assets to somebody else. This quickly gets very complicated and beyond me. But this is connecting climate change in the sense of, of shale gas exploration is a response to energy needs. It's very coupled to climate change. And there are economic aspects of this that have an impact on the environment that then downstream have an impact on, on the Anthropocene. So the connection between climate change and the Anthropocene is quite complicated. So very quickly, the conclusions, climate change itself um, does have a signal, but it's very weak so far. The source of climate change, the burning of fossil fuels and the resultant carbon isotope signature and the distribution of waste or pollutants has a very strong signal in the Anthropocene. And those signals happen to be in places that are likely to be preserved. This core is from the New Jersey marshes opposite New York City. And what you're looking at is a, is a, is a preserved oil spill from 1964, I think. Um, and on top of that, more clay deposits, more, more natural deposits, but actually Anthropocene deposits. And three, the prospect of climate change or pending climate change yields policy and a regulatory process that itself can have significant environmental presence. And this is a cover from um, a New York newspaper after um, Superstorm Sandy hit. And the paper says, never again. And in the, in the lower, smaller headline, it says, Dutch model could storm-proof the city. Another example of how uh, um, mitigation of what is ultimately a climate change effect impact uh, will lead to the development of an Anthropocene. And I think that's it. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, we'll go straight into Professor James Zavitsky. And then we'll take questions uh, a little bit later on. We've got, I think, about 15 minutes for this presentation.
Well, thank you for uh, the kind invitation to uh, present uh, this information. I was asked to talk on um, the fluvial system and its changes, river sediment and their fluxes, and the impact on downstream deltas. I have a number of movies for your entertainment, um, so I hope you enjoy them. But let's begin with uh, a little bit on sediment production. So we release a lot of sediment from doing by just manipulating the land surface. It might be these agricultural terraces that th are throughout South America and Asia and other parts of the world. The, the upper right image is a satellite image looking down on the terraces and you can see gullying on the sides of these terraces. So building the terraces themselves are designed to withhold the water and grow agricultural crops, but they are often put on landscapes that are subject to in soil instability and they themselves create a lot of sediment. The lower two images are the shocking ones. We've, we've removed entire mountain tops uh, for coal mining. This is from the US. And just a, a, an unbelievable statistic is that in the U.S. alone, there are 500,000, 568,000 abandoned mines. And you can multiply that times 10 for the whole world. So we have about 5 million abandoned mines around the world. In some of my talk, I use the term gigatons and not everyone knows what a gigaton is. So if you were to multiply the thousands of kilometers of the Great Wall of China by its meters high and its many meters wide, you get around 0.4 gigatons. So one gigaton of material is about 2.5 Great Walls of China. So when I say a gigaton, you can do the math, you multiply it by 2.5, and you get the number of Great Walls. So the Palm Islands of Dubai is 7.5 Great Walls of China. The Hong Kong Airport utilized 0.6 gigatons of sediment. And this is the kind of uh, movement of sediment that humans do. But our mining of, the, of our Earth resources is truly staggering. And coal production, we're mining at, right now, we're mining at nine gigatons per year. And if you go to the industry websites that I have done, they're suggesting that they'll be mining by 2030, 13 gigatons per year, per year. So you have to multiply that by two, uh, two and a half uh, Great Walls of China, and there you go. The, great, the global iron production is 2.2 gigatons. The global hydraulic cement is 2.2. The global aggregate, aggregates are sand and gravel. Production globally is 13 gigatons. Well, 13 gigatons is all the sediment moved by all the rivers around the world today. So we are moving more sediment by all the natural processes. And those natural processes might be by movement of water, movement of ice, or movement by wind. So humans rock, for better or worse. So this is a map of the dams in the United States. And you can see the migration of the Europeans across the continent. You see the year ticking by on top. And you see the dams proliferating in the country. I call it my Matrix movie. It's incredible. So I, I've zoomed in in this box, and I've got a satellite image that was processed just to look at all the water on that, within that box. You can see the Mississippi River that comes down to the Mississippi Delta 
barely. But all those other black areas, those are reservoirs that are behind the dams. Sometimes you see them as light blue. That's because they're trapping sediment that would otherwise get to the coastline. I've made a movie for the entire world. These are just the giant dams because I can't put all the small dams on. It would look ugly. So these large dams are the 45 meter plus dams in height. And you'll see, watch 1952 come by and China click on. It's almost instant. So this is a phenomena that's truly global. We have built one large dam on average every day for the last 130 years. One of the things that we worry about in climate change is the intensification of the hydrological cycle. If you put warm temperature on the Earth's surface, you will put more water vapor into the atmosphere. That will come down as rainfall. It will spin up cyclones and hurricanes, tornadoes. But we have a very hard time separating the engineering failures from all of this massive structure that we put on the river surface from this intensification of the water. So my group within CSDMS, the Dartmouth Flood Observatory, we, we, produce, we map the Earth's surface on a daily basis, and we map where all the floods are every day, twice a day, actually. And we map the intensification of the floods, the area that's flooded, the discharge, all of that from space. And these diagrams show two um, curves. The upper one is the very high magnitude floods which is trending up, although in the last few years it looks like it's going down. And the lower one is lower, lower intensity floods um, that show a more uh, linear increase over the last number of years that we've been mapping. One of our maps is from the Chalfreya Delta. All the area in uh, red is a flooded land. The area of that map is around uh, a few hundred kilometers wide by uh, 600 kilometers in length. And so the question is, well, is this an example of the intensification of the world's hydrological cycle from global warming? In fact, in this case, there was a cyclone that was, I shouldn't say cyclone, that's my mistake. There was a mon heavy monsoon system coming onto the land. They had store too much water in the reservoir, the dam operator got scared. They released the water rather than to let the dam open up um, through mechanical failure, and they caused the flood. So this was a human-induced flood. So when we map floods, we're not always mapping something that's tied to climate. We're, the floods are tied to human engineering. This is a set of uh, satellite images. It's a movie. Uh, if you've not seen these, they're kind of great. It shows that our hydrological system, a river, is alive. It moves, it flows, it changes its course, its shape. But we also put towns on these floodplains. And this has become is an ever-growing phenomena. And when you get into the well-developed world, such as Europe, the Havel River here flowing through Berlin, it's become more of a sluice rather than a river that is alive and movement due to morphodynamics. This is a shocking diagram. Everywhere you see a large red circle, that means the discharge has decreased by more than 30%. And so it looks like most of the river systems of Asia, Africa, Australia have decreased in their discharge. Yet I've just said that global warming is increasing the hydrological cycle through uh, water vapor intensification. 
So this decrease in discharge is simply because we now pull out the water from these reservoirs for agricultural purposes, industrial purposes, drinking water supply. We are basically growing crops in deserts. Where you see green, that's another story. Uh, where I live in the Boulder, Colorado, we pull water from one side of the mountain to the other side of the mountain. And so we shift and we increase the discharge. In addition, in the US, we're really great at pumping water out of the ground, and that also increases the discharge of these rivers. So I'm known for this diagram, so let me just spend a few seconds on it. So global warming through adding an, uh, water to the ocean surface through melting ice caps, ice sheets, and from warming the ocean surface through a uh, steric effect is increasing by just about three millimeters per year today what the ocean is increasing, okay? Just a few millimeters. But if you looked at the coastlines of around the world, it looks like sea level is rising many times that. And that's because we're subsiding the land as the ocean is going up. So for the half a billion people that are living on the coast, on these deltas, they're facing not just sea level rise, but land subsidence. And when we look at some of the causes, it could be on the, your uh, upper uh, right, you see the pole delta in, uh, near Venice, but in upper Italy. And this used to be uh, from methane mining. It was sinking at about 60 millimeters per year. It was sinking so fast, they stopped the methane mining through feedback from Venice. Uh, and, and with that, they reduced this land subsidence. Chalfreya, it's the middle upper diagram, they were sinking at 100 millimeters per year. So that's, that's order of magnitude greater than what sea level rise is happening. And that was from pumping up water for agricultural purposes. They've since introduced a tax to slow that down. The Jakarta, the figure on the upper left, in places that's now uh, four meters below sea level in the last 35 years alone. And that's from uh, infrastructure within the city. We have new satellite techniques that could detect vertical changes of one millimeter, one millimeter every few months on the land surface. And we're able to zone in where on these deltas, these flat areas, is the subsidence occurring. In China, they often occur in areas where they're pumping up water for fish farms. And there the sinking is one meter every four years. So we've been talking about millimeters of sea level rise. Well, they have another more fundamental problem, don't they? So in summary, I'm going to play you a movie and I'll wrap it up with a couple of slides. The rivers are its arteries. Rivers run down mountains through forest, flow through desert and delta course through bended bay and swerving shore and recirculate back from our ocean. Evaporation, condensation, precipitation. Access to water has defined where human populations have flourished. Civilization emerged between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers on the fertile crescent of Mesopotamia in modern day Iraq. Now we are changing the carbon and nitrogen cycles. We are altering the global water system too, through damming, extraction, irrigation, and climate change. Many rivers no longer reach the sea. We move more sediment than natural erosion and rivers. We've built 48,000 large dams. We've drained half of global wetlands. We use an area the size of South America to grow our crops, an area the size of Africa for our livestock. Agriculture accounts for 70% of global freshwater use, and we need to feed a growing population. In a single lifetime, we've become a phenomenal global force. 
We're pushing Earth into a new geological epoch. The Anthropocene, dominated by humanity. We have altered Earth's snow cover, sea ice and ocean volume, fundamental elements of the water cycle. Climate change will bring more flooding, drought and disease. A warmer atmosphere holds more water vapor. This is causing the water cycle to intensify. Wet regions are becoming wetter, dry areas drier. Rainfall patterns are changing. Damming, mining and extraction are causing two-thirds of major deltas to sink. Almost 800 million people have no safe drinking water. 2.4 billion remain without adequate sanitation. 1.7 billion people live in places where groundwater is being extracted faster than it can be replenished. Four out of five people worldwide face risk to their water security. For water security for all, we urgently need innovative and creative approaches to policy from local to global. With nations competing for limited resources, we must find better ways to manage them. And we must adapt to a changing water cycle. This is the challenge of water in the Anthropocene. So that was a movie that my organization, IGBP, uh, the International Geosphere Biosphere Program, um, put out. It's put out a number of these. You can download them, uh, the movies, on our website. This next, uh, the final two slides, very quickly, is, is really the elephant in the room. You know, part of this is the uh, population pressure that we have that's the statistic that I like to mention is that we're going to be adding a one million person city every 10 days for the next 86 years. And so we have a little social commentary. We have two worlds that we could look towards, the built world and the, and the natural world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, James. Mike, you thought you escaped, but could you please come back up again for questions? <laughs> so, how, how long have you got? Ten, we have ten minutes for questions, so please, uh, if you have anything, come to the microphones. Have any questions? There we go. Good morning. Uh, I would have two questions. The first one would be uh, about the, the way you measure the signals. When you go back to, let's say, one century, two centuries, is it because uh, we don't have any measurement before that time or because we can measure them from now? And the second question would be do you know if there is a representation or something like a chart which would draw all the um, uh, factors of change uh, from the different disciplines into one single visualization. Thank you. I'll just comment on the, the last point actually that uh, in many cases what we've been doing in the presentations is, is concentrating on one particular representation and saying there's a possibility this could represent uh, the base of the Anthropocene. But realistically, as an organization, the, the AWG will be taking all of these criteria, um, putting them together to then compile a relationship, the one you're just talking about, uh, to see w at what time interval all of the various signatures uh, represent a significant change. And I think that's pr probably the, one of the main aspects of our research over the next few years. So we don't have a single figure that shows you that now. But perhaps in two or three years' time, that's what we'll be trying to show you. But with regard to the, the other signatures, did you have any um, in particular in mind with regard to whether we have information from several centuries ago? 
Was it, was it temperature or, or something else? Yeah, for instance, you, you were talking about the, the change in the, of the temperature in the surface of the ocean or the surface of the yeah, air. Okay. Um, I mean, in rocks, it's, I understand that you can see it with isotopes in rocks, but f for short memory things, uh, when, did it, when did we start to measure that? Well, there are ways to estimate temperature as far back as well, many, many millions of years ago. But, and, and the farther back in time you go, the more difficult it is, of course. The uncertainties are quite large. But there are various biogeochemical um, and, and t um, plant physiognomy methods to infer temperature. It's, it's called paleo, paleo temperatures. And usually those are of sea surface temperatures. Um, it's much more difficult to estimate an air temperature. There are, there are some ways to do it, uh, not, not as far back as um, tens of millions of years, but um, so typically it's sea surface temperatures. There are also ways to get temperatures more directly from ice cores using trapped atmospheric gases. Those go back about a maximum at the moment about 800,000 years. And, and to go to your first question, or your second question, I just wanted to add quickly that uh, the, the International Geosphere Biosphere Program is combining with the International Human Dimension Program and the Biodiversity Program called Diversitas and the World Climate Research Program to form one organization called Future Earth. And that organization is designed to bring together the various social sciences, natural sciences, uh, um, economics, law, into one think tank kind of international activity to help address these needs that go beyond any one discipline. Hello, Chris thank you. Christina Reed, freelance science journalist. And I just wanted to clarify, so not only is it that you see changes in sea level rise that are different around the world, um, and currently we're looking at the millimeter scale, but that in the past it's so varied at the meter scale that you can't, you can't see the difference and that that wouldn't be a, a, an Anthropocene signal. Well, okay, it, it, hadn't, it depends on, on the time window that you look at things. Um, but let me, let me just go backwards in time from, from now, and I'll, you can tell me to stop when I've gone far enough back. But uh, at the moment, it's about 3.2 millimeters a year. If you go back to about, say, 14,000 years ago, it was on the order of between 20 and 40 millimeters a year. It was incredibly rapid. Before that, um, it sort of oscillated on the, in a scale of millimeters per year. It, it, it never gets faster than, um, or at least not that we know, faster than several tens of millimeters a year. So it never gets to meters per year, for example. But the absolute change over, over time, of course, has fluctuated many meters, um, hundreds of meters. So that if you look at a big time window, yeah, the difference in sea level can, can change by many hundreds of meters, but that takes a long time to do, of course. My name is Dino Trescher, science journalist, and uh, thank you for hitting us on the elephant in the room. And my question or remark would be, if we as human beings have such a fundamental impact in changing matter on this planet, uh, first question is, what do we tell our children? Second, you mentioned the project Future Earth. Could you elaborate about the impact of Future Earth on, let's say, public reasoning? And my final remark would be, you may add a parameter of risk on your uh, slides, which may indicate where we not have to worry, but uh, where we really have to worry. 
And um, my last remark would be, um, if you just add uh, a couple of figures of what this means for the life-threatening of human beings, so we have a real, of course we have real data and all that, but uh, I think if we would have a clear view of how many people uh, are now, let's say, threatened by these risks, so we know what is at stake. Thank you. I, that was so many questions, I don't remember them all. Um, it would have been better if you had asked one and then asked another. Uh, but let me just see if I can hit some of these, uh, what I do remember. Uh, you, you said something about what would I uh, tell my children or grandchildren, which I have grandchildren. Um, you know, it's about our sustainability uh, on this planet. You know, we have in the past walked with a really heavy footprint. And humanity has walked with a very heavy footprint. And I think we've walked with this heavy footprint from maybe religious or cultural reasons that have not really held us back from this heavy footprint. We have an economic model that was talked about last night that I think needs, needs some reflection on so that we can be successful as a human species but also accept our role as being just one of the species on this planet and to uh, lighten our footprint. So that's what I would be advising. I'm, I'm a bit of a Pollyanna. I don't know if that word translates to, to uh, the German language, but a Pollyanna means that I tend to be very rosy. I look on the positive side of everything. Um, and I really would like us in the audience and in our daily lives to to be very positive about this, but also to take seriously the magnitude of what we're doing. And it's often that we, we're we so, until we get far out from the planet's surface and look down, do we see how absolutely huge our footprint is? You know, when, when I, you know, I give, I travel around the world a lot and give a lot of these talks and and often they're specialized, so I may give a talk on dams. Well, dams are, are a good example of, they do a lot of good. They do a lot of good. I mean, they're generally generating electricity, and that electricity is definitely not a greenhouse gas. So that's helping to keep the power up and lower the greenhouse gas production. But those dams are trapping sediment. The sediment doesn't get down to where it used to get great consequences, deltas are sinking. When we put the dams in, we didn't necessarily think about the bad that they could do. We thought about the good they could do. We were putting the water out for drinking supply, air, agriculture. And so balancing these pluses and minuses is something we have to do, but we can't just let engineers who build a dam do it. We have to take the big picture, a whole river basin picture, a whole continent picture. Look at, you know, earth system science is, is, is to collect all these hot spots of damage that we've done and try to figure out ways of getting them back on track. So I'm positive and I would like you to be positive too, but also to represent the big picture. I'm going to respond to that question too, more to the tenure of the question and the last part of it, which was about, um, I think it was about um, positing that, that um, humans may cease to exist or something like that. And I think that's um, a kind of fear-mongering in a way. Um, I don't think we'll ever get to that, that stage. Um, and I would, sort of, as part of the answer, I would, I would disagree respectfully with my esteemed colleague here, that, that the elephant in the room, actually there are two elephants in the room, um, one of them, and it's not population, it's, it's energy, 
um, and its, its, its society. Uh, that is to say, uh, the sustaining of a stable society, which in turn enables the development of technology, which with energy allows Earth to continue in a habitable way uh, into the future. There's a very good presentation, I'm sure many of you have seen it, by Hans Rosling uh, on YouTube. It's part of um, the global health issues he talks about. He talks about the invention of the washing machine and how that, on a very personal level, enabled him to um, develop his career because his mother didn't have to spend so much time washing clothes, she could instead read to him. And a washing machine is a perfect example of the sort of symbiosis between technological development, the availability of energy, which happens in a stable society. Um, those are the things that we need to worry about, not the, the, the extinction of the human race. And I'd like to comment on my <laughs> esteemed colleague, uh, Dr. Ellis. So, I mean, it, we can have more and more people on Earth as long as we generate more and more energy and ways to feed them. Okay, I mean, that's true. I mean, that's a truism. And, and, uh, our population is increasing, there's not much we can do about that, and we're gonna to have to find both the food resources and the uh, energy resources to keep that system going. So where I disagree is, it's an unsustainable trend. And what I've seen in terms of just the way we behaved in the last 60, 70 years, is that our footprint keeps increasing, not decreasing. The more toys we have, the more gadgets we have, the more we're now taking, uh, I've got statistics on how we're all now doing international vacations. Well, we used to, vacation in the old days was visiting grandmother down the road. I mean, things have really changed. And so our capabilities, our desires are outstripping our ability to get the resources, the energy, and the food systems uh, managing that. I'm sure we're going to improve. I sh I'm sure we are. And I'm sure you could probably take the number and say, well, in an ideal science fiction world, could this Earth have 15 billion people? I would say probably. But I, I just don't know uh, whether that's the right way of looking at the problem. Oh, and Mike says he's the Pollyanna, so... Uh. <laughs> Any more questions? I think we're probably getting to a point... Oh, we've got one more over here. Oh, no, queuing up. <laughs> yeah, I'm just wondering about the tension between um, people like us who are sitting in this room and um, listening to these discussions and aware of climate change and the discussions about the Anthropocene because it's so prevalent today. We can't really escape the topic. And we might try to make a difference through different ways, um, talks and even interventions and so on. But I'm just wondering about the relationship between these discussions to the people who actually have the control and can um, instigate uh, a transition, for example, or specifically in the UK, um, what kind of relationship do you have to the government in the UK, for example, the research that you're doing at the universities, and is there a way of overcoming the ignorance that's existing within, yeah, on a governmental level? That's, that's a very, very good question, and, and I think um, it's true to say that each of us struggles in, in, in our own way with trying to answer that question and trying to connect to, um, or make connections between science and policy is extraordinarily difficult for us. Um, so I would go back to something I said when I was standing down there earlier on, that we should not underestimate the power of an idea. And 
again, in formalizing the Anthropocene and in, in continuing to, sp to spread this word, to propagate it through you, for example, and you go out and further propagate it, it has a lot of power. And it will, um, if the idea is good and, and solid and has, has cogency, it will begin to make a difference. But it's very difficult to anticipate exactly how we, we draw those threads of connective tissue between the scientist, the policymaker, between social scientist and scientist, etc., etc. To some extent, there has to be, um, we have to kind of believe in this process that there's power in a good idea, and let's at least get the idea out there. And, you know, just quickly, I have the privilege of meeting many of these uh, ministers and secretaries in my role as chair of IGBP. And I've, I've always been impressed with the, uh, the, the cleverness and knowledge that these folks have. Um, I didn't expect that. And so, you know, I'm sure there are exceptions out there. Uh, but I think that... They are getting the messages. They are having to do the impossible, balancing the political and the needs with the powerful, with the realities that society, uh, science is providing them. It's a difficult job, but I think that many of the ones that I meet are working in that direction. So. Yeah, Ute Klissenbaum, my name. Um, I found an article um, suggesting that, um, the, uh, that climate change um, plays a role uh, at, uh, in the Ebola outbreak. And um, I would like to read you the one sentence, maybe you, you could com comment on that. Um, a, a 2002 study found that a, that a, a dropped um, shift from dry to wet conditions are associated with the Ebola outbreak in Africa. And climate change is making um, those shifts more likely. West Africa is, is already reeling from climate impact. Sierra Leone, the, for example, is coping with um, seasonal droughts, strong winds, thunderstorms, um, and so on. Maybe I would like to see if you could what to comment on this I, I'm not aware that uh, you know this uh, animal to human trans uh, transmission of a virus uh, has a climate story to it it these things are very difficult to uh, connect even if there was a climate story it would be a huge task to prove that Hello, uh, my name is Alan Friedlob. I um, live one mile from the third largest oil refinery on the west coast of the United States. Uh, that is owned by uh, British Petroleum, BP. Um, and I want to share a quick story with everybody here to create a little bit more awareness of what's going on in uh, my neck of the woods, in my neighborhood, and then ask a question. Uh, every day uh, when I go to town, I pass a unit oil train of oil by rail that's being sent from North Dakota to the West Coast to this particular refinery. A unit train has 100 uh, tanker cars of oil in it, 30,000 gallons in each uh, car every day coming back and forth. So the impact in what I've learned so far in the conference in the Anthrop Anthropocene is uh, each of these oil refineries has built an off-railway facility. Um, uh, BP's was $60 million investment to process this oil on a daily basis. The cars go back and forth in a unit train. A mile uh, from my house, I'll also face uh, the possible construction of the largest coal uh, shipping facility in the United States. Um, it will ship 58 million tons of coal from the Powder River Basin in Montana. So this, this coal will go 1,500 miles as the Bakken oil goes 1,500 miles from North Dakota and will be shipped uh, to India and China 
uh, from uh, my uh, neighborhood. So this is a very personal uh, thing to me that you all should be aware of. Um, one of our colleagues who just asked about control, I think you should know something about control. Uh, the trains uh, of the Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad is owned outright by Warren Buffett as part of his portfolio in, in Berkshire Hathaway. He controls the trains and the stock, he controls the railroad and any Anthropocene impacts uh, that he makes on the environment by uh, putting more rail line down to ship this oil. Um, he controls it outright. Um, secondly, 15% uh, of the Canadian National Railway, which ships tar sands oil from Alberta, is owned by Bill Gates. Sir, and can, it, we, can we get to your question? Yeah, the question is very simple. Uh, we touched on control. We touched on anthropocenic impacts in my neighborhood. Now, as a citizen science, how do you translate your research and data into what I can do and what my uh, friends, colleagues, and neighbors can do to measure the anthropocenic impacts? Um, I guess that the simplest thing you can do is to, is to vote for the right person. Um, and in, then is to organize lo local regional groups that then can then lobby politicians. Um, I know that sounds like a trite answer, but uh, a lot of people don't vote. Uh, so voting is a fundamental thing that you, sh you, you, I'm sure you do do that anyway. I've just been told that uh, Andy Revkin uh, of the New York Times and dot, dot Earth will speak to that issue. So I'm gonna let him do that later. The voting or the oil train issue? I think the issue is what can you do? The what you can do issue. The what you can do issue. I think we're probably winding up at this point. We've, we've on, overgone our time allocation. Uh, do we start the next session? After a break, we have a, a short coffee break now. Thank you.